Hey, this is John Tempesta, and you're breaking down my fucking career. I've always loved drums as a kid, you know? And, I, and then I seen Ringo Starr on a Hard Day's Night with my mom on TV. And like, I seen this guy play drums like, wow, this is so cool. He's a drummer, he's fucking amazing. I wanna be like that. And honestly, it was like seven years old. And then, and then after that, my next door neighbor, um, Charlie Castelluccio, is a good friend of mine. My mom would buy me drum kits like for Christmas, like the, the cheap like Christmas kits, you know? And I would break them in an hour, paper heads. So Charlie, like he had a drum kit next door. He was like, honestly, he was like the next door neighbor, like over the porch. He had his kit in his basement. He was like, okay. He worked his way up to his gold sparkle kit. I had the blue sparkle kit. And I, I, he goes, I'll sell you my kit for $25. So I begged my mom, like, please, please give me this, buy this kit. And she gave in. And I, I took the kit over the porch. Honestly, serious, man. I actually took the drum kit over. It was a Sunday, put it in the basement. And I, I just fell in love. That was it for me. I had a real drum kit. I put like, I cleaned it up. I put jewelry around it. And since then, that, that was it for me, you know? Like, I think I was 12 years old. And then later on, Charlie, knowing that I was really into drums, um, he was a big Bowie, like, you know, he, he was the cool guy, Jagger dude. Because I have tickets for uh, fucking David Bowie at Madison Square Garden, this is 1977. And asked my mom, like, hey, can I take Johnny to the concert? And, uh, and um, we went together on the train. And it was shitty tickets, but not shitty for me because I was a side stage with Dennis Davis playing drums. It was like Stage Sensation Tour. And I, I watched Dennis with the North drums and the, the China cymbals on. And I just like Madison Square Garden. And that, that was it for me. It was like, I have to do this for the rest of my life. Being a great drummer is definitely um, a lot of practice, a lot of heart, a lot of soul, and dedication. You know what I mean? For me, I like as a kid, I, I've always stayed in and I just practiced drums a lot. In, in studying with a great teacher takes you a long way. And um, it was like a school teacher for me. I had this great teacher, John Spina, as a kid. And he, got, he actually took me to see shows when I was underage, seeing Steve Gadd. I was like 15 years old. And um, that was it for me. I mean, and I, I, I would just really practice a lot and not go out with my friends, the guys that went out on parties on weekends. I would stay home and like really like, you know, tone in, like really get into and learn, you know what I mean? And listen and listen to a lot of music. So Exodus was, as far as that, that happened, was being on tour, the Headbangers Ball Tour. Right, I was Charlie Benanti's drum tech, and you know, there's a 19 what 88, right? So 87, I did the whole Among the Living tour, and so um, Tom Hunting couldn't do the tour; he was ill or whatever it happened, and um, they were looking for a drummer, and I'm like, they asked me because they see me sound check, like you know Charlie's drums. I would always like just practice. But I'm like, wow, I never played that type of music before. I was always a hard rock, like heavy metal drummer, Cozy Powell, UFO, Thin Lizzy, Judas Priest, you know, Iron Maiden. And, um, and I said to Charlie, like, they asked me, like, dude, you wanna do this tour? I'm, I'm like, well, I don't know if I could do this, you know? And I, I watched Charlie every night, and like the greatest drummer ever. And I'm like, I don't know if I could do this. He goes, you have to do this, you know? You have to do this, man. And so I honestly air played the songs and like fucking just listen and listen. I love Exodus, obviously. They're fucking great. And um and that's that was the sort of it. And like they asked me to, to do the, the first album, like the tour. It, it, it was a big thing. It was like Fabulous Disaster. It was a big tour for them. And then they went on a headline tour after the, the Headbangers Ball tour. And um yeah, man. And the fucked up thing was we started in Lamores in Brooklyn, like my hometown. Oh, it was fucking nuts. But before that, like get my drum kit, going up to the Bay Area and like listen to songs like I never played this. I ne actually never, never played with them before. We have a tour booked, right? And like and I'm listening and 
I, every gig I got is from airplane. So I actually, I'm, okay, I could do this. And they love it. And then we went on tour and that was it, man. And from there, it's just a little fucking kid, you know? <laughs> it's like, how does this happen? Like, I was fucking scared as shit, but you know what? You have to take your chances in life, and which I did. You know what? I would have loved to stay with Charlie or like live, uh, Will from Live in Color because um, they opened up for Anthrax in England. It was like, dude, you want to come, come on tour in tech for me? We're opening up for the Stones, the Steel Wheels tour. I'm like, so I got this, and I was like, fuck. No, I got to play. And he, and he agreed. And it was a great thing for me. It was a learning process. And the guys in Exodus couldn't be like more like open and, you know, because they, they're successful. They've been there. But this is my first time playing with a band, right? And it was fucking amazing. I mean, I love those guys at that till this day, man. Gary, Rick, Zetro, and, you know, Rob McKillop and like you know, Tom Hunting, you know what I mean? You know, I filled in for Tom last year, you know, it was a great thing. So I think being at the right place at the right time is a big factor too. Testament Low was, was a record that um, we worked our asses off at. Honestly, I was living in LA, which I did. I spent a lot of time with Walter Morgan, who lived with Chuck, Billy, and Tiffany. And I, I honestly, I had a futon in his basement, not a lot of money. And we, we would go in like Jackson Street Studios in Oakland. And Eric and I actually wrote that record together a lot. He would pick me up and go to Pete's Coffee, go to Jackson Street Studios. He had these riffs, drum machine, and like of the riffs he wanted and drum machine wise. And um, we jammed a lot. We played a lot, you know? And then uh, that's when James Murphy came into the whole camp. Mike Gitter was a big part of that. It was Atlantic Records. He was our A&R guy. So long story short, like spending a lot of time eating ramen, blah, blah, blah. But we worked, we worked really fucking hard. I never worked so hard on a record. I've never been so proud of a record because I think it shows on that one too, you know? And coming to LA, which is like, we recorded a record at a &M Studios, which is now Henson Studios. And then Bill Kenny and, and Garth, Garth, you know, good, 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 Garth produced it. And uh, it was a great learning experience, man. And um, I'm very proud of that record. Actually, that record, we, I think we broke the record for the most microphones ever, 45 microphones on the drum kit, which is ridiculous now. Like, you really need that much? Because Motley Crue just did like Dr. Feel Good and like they were trying to like, oh, let's top this one. Like top and bottom mics and cymbals and everything. It sounded killer in there with a PA system and all. We got some good takes and, and, and I do listen to that record quite often and I'm very proud of it. That's one of my favorite records of all time. Like, you know, because that, that was heart and soul. The song Low, I was kind of pissed off like, because there's a PA in there. There's no click track or nothing. We're doing this all live, right? And I'm like, all right, everybody out of the room. I'm like, and I, I, I did the whole song about myself. That whole song is without a band. Low. Did no click track or nothing. I just knew the song in my head. Like, I just went for it. You know what I mean? Obviously, there was stuff like, you know, with, with a, uh, a producer guy in there doing like Pro Tools and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I, ju I just went for it. I was like, just, I just, I'm feeling it. Just get out of the room. Let me do my thing. Because it sounded so killer in that room with a PA system and everything. Listen to that record and I listen back and there's, there's stuff like Chasing Fear was one of the first songs we did. That's a tough song, man, you know? And then, and Ride was the last song we actually recorded uh, where we actually wrote and then we did that one. It's like, fuck. It, and that song is so fucking heavy. Um, yeah, it, that record to me, like, you know, those guys didn't really, they weren't into being in LA and stuff. Is I liked it because I lived in LA at the time, so it was close to my house. But we got the job done. And I, I think at, at the end of the day, you know, it was cool. It's fucked up at the, in a way because Michael Wagner was mixing the record, right? And that's when I got the white zombie uh, call. I was like, and I had to tell, I had to tell Chuck, listen, I got this gig, man. And I, I feel like I need to move forward as much as I love you guys. I'm not dicking you, but it's, it's something that for me, it, it, I needed to move forward, you know what I mean, in my life. And Eric's on vacation and on his honeymoon. Like, oh. 
Yeah. So, but we're, we're still, we're brothers and everything. It happens and everything happened for the best. And, you know, where Astro Creep started was, um, I was with, yeah, with Testament at Walter's basement. And um, I got calls. I knew Walter O'Brien really well from Concrete Management, as well as a couple other people. Sherry Moon, Sherry Zombie. Uh, I know, I've known her before, Rob, and she put a good word in for me. And, like, I just, I just felt like it, it was a great thing. Maybe because living in L.A. and like, I don't know, I, I love the guys and I love everything about that record. I just felt like that next step and for me at the time. And you know what I mean? And, I, and sometimes you take chances in life and that's what I did. You know what I mean? And it happened, you know, it was a great success and I was very proud of it. And, um, and I'm very proud of Testament, but the, the Astro Creep record was, it was huge, you know what I mean? Not knowing, but I just took a chance. It was like, it was more in my element too, as far as like groove playing. And like, I knew this band needed that thing. You know what I mean? They were cool, but they, I just felt like I could give them that extra thing. You know what I mean? And when we did that record, man, and this is a funny story, man. We, we, we're fucking, we're rehearsing right in the record at Bill's place, the old studio in North Hollywood, right? And um, we're right in the record. And on the fucking four track, little four track, Rob's sitting there and like recording stuff. And um, they did the Airheads movie, like the, you know, they were in the, they were the band in the movie, right? Okay, we're, we're gonna do a premiere. We're, we're playing the Viper Room for the movie. I'm like, okay. So I'm, I'm still in Testament, right? I'm still in Testament. Nobody tells me anything. I'm fucking, okay, I'm writing the record. This is cool. You know what? Great, I'm living in LA and, um, so we played a Viper Room and like Chris Farley and Tom Arnold, like they introduced us. It was amazing, Airheads. You would open up with fucking Chill in the Grave. It was great. So a after the show, I, 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 I go to Andy Gould, the manager for White Zombie. I'm like, hey man, I, just have, to I have to ask you something. So am I in the band? <laughs> I'm like, I'm right, I'm, I'm spending like time here. I was like, oh, you're in the band. So that was my, my thing there, White Zombie. Like, welcome to the band from the management. More Human Than Human was a drum beat I came up with in the studio. And in Bill's place, just just jamming this Bonham. I'm a big Bonham guy, right? I'm doing this groove and Rob goes, keep playing that song. Keep playing that riff. And on the four track thing, right? And when we went in the studio, we recorded it. I never thought that song would even make the record, man. And all of a sudden, he starts doing his vocals. He's in this booth, right? Watching horror movies or whatever it is. That's how Rob does his stuff. Then Jay does a slide and like, it was fucking, who knew how big that song would have been? You know what I mean? Crazy. I never thought that song would make the fucking record, honestly. Oh, Sean is my, she's, well, she's like my sister. I mean, one of my best friends and, and Jay. It was a great experience, man, you know? And I'll never forget the first time I auditioned in front of him, I, um, it was Sean and I, who was it? The first song was Black Sunshine, du, 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 you know? And I just kicked it in. I remember Rob, like, it was like, cause I was like playing hard. It's like, I knew they needed that, that extra thing, you know? And it just, it worked. And um, yeah, man. And Jay was like, and we have so much like common interest in music, like, from metal to, you know, he's a punker, as well as Shauna, you know? It, it, was, it was a different dynamic, but it worked, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, we were actually, we worked, we worked pretty fucking hard on that tour, you know? But we didn't tour enough in Europe, which I wish we, we would have done, you know? That Pantera tour, you know, what was it, the War of Gantch was? That was huge, you know what I mean? And if, if that would have succeeded, it would have been great, but listen. It was, and we got to do it. So uh, it just sucks for the fans not be able to see it, like in Europe and whatnot. You know, we did some festivals. We did, we did uh, uh, Donington. I'll never forget that one. I think we went on like one thirty afternoon, and no one woke us up on the bus. And like, fuck, we came from somewhere, and COC is on stage. Like, you, you guys are going on like an hour or so. <laughs> like, what? And it was crazy, like 75,000 people, but we killed it, man. And we were the only band to do that. And the next day, played the Reading Festival because we had this, we had the metal and the alternative thing, you know? And that was way better, like, you know what I mean? Right. 
right. it was it was cool. That was the thing about zombie back in the day. You know, you had metal and and alternative. You you know, we could kind of switch that thing. That was a tough thing because I know Rob had enough of it. Like you know, it happens. I don't I don't want to get into you know specifics and everything, but he just wasn't happy and like the guys they just separate buses and blah 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 and like it was kind of the end of the end but I was like I I fucking I was pissed like fuck I could audition for the Smashing Pumpkins or something I had something stupid like that and then Rob goes I'm gonna do this record and I want you to come aboard and like oh thank because yeah, Rob and I we got along really well you know as well as the other guys but he wanted to do his own thing and um and yeah and who knew, who, how crazy is that one? Like doing that record, how that thing blew up. And that's talk about timing. I'm telling you right now, man, timing is everything, especially at that time. Manson went kind of glam, I think. This is what I feel. Remember he did like the glam thing and Zombie just went hard and the kids wanted some hard shit. It was the perfect fucking time, you know? Well, that record was, we're at Scott Humphrey's house up in the Hollywood Hills, and he's good buddies with Tommy Lee. So Tommy's there, I'm like, oh, dude, I'm like, I felt bad. I'm like, fuck, hey, man, I got my drum kit set up here. If you want to fucking, you know, jam on the kit, just get something. He goes, thanks, bro. He wanted to play a couple songs on the record. That record is so chopped. So I don't even know what I played on that record, to be honest with you, because there's, there's a lot of drum machine on it. There's, there's a lot of players. But I think it's, sonically, it's an amazing record. Like, Danny Loner from Nine Inch Nails started that with Rob. Then Riggs came in. Um, I think it's, I listen to it a lot. I mean, when you kick in the Super Beast, it's like fucking punches in the face. You know what I mean? Right. But it was, it was a, good, a good record, but I can't take credit for, like, being on the record because I don't even know what I played on the fucking record. But the tour was great. We toured with Korn. We, we did some great tours together in the... It was fun, you know? Big production, I love the fire. It was like, you know, being a kid growing up is like fucking with Kiss and all that stuff. It was the biggest thing ever, man. I think we had the most pyro ever at the time. It was great. Hellman came, this is after Rob. The band broke up. Well, Rob, he goes, I'm gonna take a break, man. I'm gonna do movies, you know, like, okay. So my friend Renee Mata um, from New York, Good friend of my, my, my friend Dante Renzi, singer in this band, Reach. He goes, I'm, I'm friends with Paige. Paige is moving out to LA, right? Because you guys should hook up. Like, I'm a big Helmet family. I was kind of really intimidated like by Paige because, you know, he's like the fucking the genius guy, g guitar player. So we met at the Canton Fiddle. Like, we actually hung out. And we, you know, we just had a couple drinks, did some Jaeger shots, and Paige goes, here's, here's my demo. Like, nah, fuck that. I have a drum room. Bring an amp in, and we'll jam, you know? And that was it. He came in there, we jammed a couple songs, and it was perfect. We just felt that it was a vibe that happened immediately. And um, we've been friends ever since. And, like, and he pushed me to, like, the limit as far as my potential as a drummer. Um, yeah, and I love him to death. He's one of my best friends, and that was great. That only lasted a couple of years until the cult thing came, you know, so, but it was great. And I'll, I'll never forget this because we were at the camp fiddle and Chris Trainer, who's in, in, in Bush, right? He was a guitar player in Bush now. Um, we're hanging out and Paige goes, I got great news. Jimmy Iovine called me because he signed Hellman. He was one of the first bands he signed because he wants to do another record. I'm like, uh, I'm like, Hellman, like, uh, I don't want to touch on John Stinger stuff because John's like, you know, it's like, all right. And, but I, I, I gave it like, if I'm going to play Hellman to, to the, to true, true to John, I put it exactly like John, as much as I could. It's not going to be the same. And so then we did Size Matters, and it was a great record, man. I'm very proud of that record. Well, that one came, I got a call. It was Mike Monarillo, TKO Management. And they were handling the calls like, hey, man, we are, we're going to put the cult, we're doing the thing with the cult again back together. And, and like, would you, would you want to, like, are you interested? And I'm like, fuck no. You know why? Because 13 years prior, check this story out, I was in Testament and I went to audition for the cult. Like, because Ron Lafitte 
you know, Marlon Feet, Megadeth, and like he was like the vice president, of, president of Capitol Records. He goes, Johnny, I want you to fucking play with the cult. He goes, you know, it was the whole thing at the time. I'm like, okay, and I love the cult. I, I, Charlie Bonante and I went to see the Electric Tour at the fucking Forum in, in, in you know, Madison Square Garden. Anyhow, long story short, and I wore a fucking love shirt when I was a teenager, okay? So I went, I, you know, I, I learned this song, like, there was a new song that Rick Rubin did called The Witch. It was a demo. I'm like, fucking, this is badass. I like this, you know? And um, I went, so anyhow, I'm staying in my friend's apartment. I had no money, man. I was crashing in my friend's apartment in fucking North Hollywood. I'm like, and I asked him, like, okay, I have an audition for the cult at Third Encore Studios. He drove me in his little shitty Honda Civic. And this is before cell phones, right? It was a hot fucking day in LA, you like, you know, like, when it's like Africa hot, <laughs> fuck, it was miserable. But I was really, I was really excited, like, I'm gonna get this gig. I, I knew it, you know, I, I felt it. I was like, I'm gonna knock them out. I show up to the audition, they never show up. I go up to the front, I was like, I'm here for the cult of the, no, they're done. I'm like, what do you mean they're done? So Ron has no idea, the manager, I have to go fucking, my friend drops me off, right? No cell phone. I have to get chains to go to a fucking pay phone to call Ron Lafayette. Like, where the fuck are these guys, man? It's like, what are you talking about? Like, they didn't show up. Like, this and him. So I have to call my friend to pick me up on this shitty Honda again. So 13 years later, I'm auditioning for the cult and I got the gig on Valentine's Day. It took me 17 years in February, okay? And I, and I always tell those guys, you fuck, you guys are a dick. But you know what? Then again, if I would have taken that gig, I would never have gotten the white zombie gig. They really got me, you know, right. timing is everything. Being at the right place at the right time. Choice of Weapon was a great record. We recorded right down the hill here. And it was Chris Goss from Masters Reality, which I love. He's a dear friend. He produced that record. And we did a lot. A lot of it was, you know what I mean? And it just, and I put two kits in the studio and, but he brought a lot out of me, you know? As well as, um, then, then, Bob Rock wound up coming after and mixing the record, finishing it. And then we did the last, the record, not this previous record, but the record before, Hidden City with Bob Rock. Scared the shit out of me. That guy scared the living, I mean, I was like fucking, but he brought, honestly, as a drummer, like, it's like, he's like, sing, sing that part. Like, you know what I mean? The part you're gonna do, just sing it, which I never done. And Bob was right in my face and like, as a producer, like, I'll never forget that, like that, like he brought that out of me, man, you know? It's so great working with all these great people, like all the producers I worked with, like from fucking Terry Date to, to you know, Bob Rock to Chris God, you know what I mean? It's fucking amazing. I'm so grateful, man. Mother Sister came about as Scott's birthday party. He was renting uh, Justin from Tool's place, right? And he had a studio in there. It's like, oh, let's fucking, do a jam and Jay Rustin it's like let's do a live jam thing and it just became this magical thing of like we have to record it right we're doing like shots of tequila afterwards like we do the record so like a few weeks later we were in the studio and we recorded that first record like live in like three days get off right it, we recorded at 606 Dave Grohl studio right right before the pandemic and a friend of mine worked uh, knew someone who works at the governor's office and she gave me warnings like they're gonna do a lockdown in LA So it was like the last day, right? We were gonna do some cover songs and so I go hey, man They're gonna fucking lock this thing down and we're like, oh shit Everybody's freaked out. We all left. It was a rainy day like tonight here in LA and I remember driving home from Topanga No, no, it was in fucking Northridge. That's where Dave's Grohl studio is at. I remember going to Albertson's market and just stocking up like, like it's just the end. And, and honestly, it didn't happen, but it happened like two days later. The lockdown actually did happen, but we finished the record. And unfortunately, it took two years later to finish the track. So nobody wanted to do anything, you know? But that record's killer, man. I mean, the drum sounds like, for me, like, at Dave Grohl's studio, like, that studio is magical, man. And Jay Rustin didn't have to do shit to it. Like, as far as effects, it was like, it was like so live. And we, we record live, Mother Sister. We'll just do a couple takes live, you know? A couple overdubs, vocals, and everything. So, it's a fun band, and uh, hopefully do some more stuff down the line. 
Exodus, the first record, man. I mean, because that was a, like, you know, it was my first record as a kid. But these these guys, we were going fast, man. And I'm thinking of um, Impact is Imminent, man. There's some songs in that one, like, fuck. We just went full on. And the Testament low, like I said, doing the low record. And um, that was pretty tricky, you know, just being on top of it. Um, Helmet, I mean, they're all, you know, but you want to give your best performance at every time. So it's hard to pick one. But I would say Change Under the Guard because that one was fucking hard, man. And I was a kid. It was like the first time being in the recording studio, like recording, like, uh, you know, on the light. It's like being on the lights right now. And like, you're, you, you're like, here we go. Right. So I would have to say, yeah, one of those. So my first one would be, there's Luna. It's that the Pearl Free Floater snare drum it, that was recorded on Exodus. Impact is imminent. That's my first white zombie snare drum. Okay, this is the first one. Well, this isn't the actual snare drum, but it's the same one. But I gave the original one to Charlie Bonanti, which he recorded Fistful of Metal, Spreading the Disease, SOD. Um, Astral Creep 2000. Not the same snare, but the dupe, you know, I bought the, that one. <laughs> This is my fucking crazy dog. Uh, Danny Carey gave me this one. His Sono Bronze. This is Charlie. I have Charlie snare drum here. Uh, my fuck. I use this on Testament at Wacken Festival. Cozy Powell snare drum. The Exodus drum head. Force of Habit. Okay. This one I use on uh, Choice of Weapon. My Black Beauty from the 80s. This is like Kenny Aronoff gave me this one. And my buddy uh, Kelly from Failure gave me this one. It belonged to Frankie Benali, 1926, because he knew we were friends. And uh, so he gave this as a gift, which is really nice. Nico McBrain, I got this one. My old 70s, 60s, Ludwig 70s, 60s, Sonar 60s, Slingland 60s. Shut the fuck up, dog! It's <laughs> in the Rounding up my good friend in Vancouver, stainless steel, titanium, fucking brass. This is my snare drum. The JT, come on over there, you know? And there you go. And, and I've been collecting pedals, obviously. I started double bass with this guy in uh, New York. He was a big Jethro Hall fan. So, not that I play him, but I always wanted this 252 pedal. And I just got this from Pro Drum on the Christmas party. It's a ghost pedal, which I studied with my old drum teacher that Alex Van Halen played, early Van Halen records, so. Dude, that's like a 1920s pedal. My friend gave these to me. These are really old. Yeah. This, this is one of the pedals when I've grown up. Like, this is a, Peter Chris played this pedal. And my old Speed King, my brother got that for me. And this is a pedal when I was a teenager. I, 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 I played on that pedal, yeah. Okay. All right, enough of the dog!